So welcome here tonight to OVC, and uh, fortunately our weather is much better tonight than before, or last week, so we got wimpy Canadians and postponed it a week. I know everybody's laughing at us, but still, it was much better this week. So I'm Paul Woods. I was just going to go over an intro of what we have here. We do have a number of cases set up, but also if you've brought some cases in, we can do your guys first because you'd be more important than ours. And some of this, I guess, is being webcast, so that's why we're going to keep flip-flopping with the uh, microphone as well. And my question to Kevin, is it loud enough? Good answer. Okay, so I was just going to talk again. Who here has uh, not been on OVC, say, in the last year? Some people, okay, because there's certainly a lot of changes you'll see uh, with the construction going on, and then in the last two years, the construction with the Animal Cancer Center. So really, the difference of what's new at OVC in the oncology group has been the Pet Trust. And so the funding from the Pet Trust has allowed us to redevelop the area that was pathobiology, so 12,000 square feet we've made into the Mona Campbell Center for Animal Cancer. And at the same time, added some other things like a linear accelerator, so a radiation therapy unit, and it also helped us with some of the people we've got as well. I've got some, uh, just a list here for the different people we have. So just to uh, go over that for medical oncology, we have Daniel Richardson, who's coming a little bit later. We have Tony Mutzers over here, and myself. For radiation oncology, coming a little bit later is Val Poyer, and she's got her uh, linear accelerator that, again, if uh, People have not been to the Animal Cancer Center. We could take you on a tour afterwards and show you our radiation unit. And, on, and in comes Danielle, just on time. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. That was her cue. And then surgical oncology, we have Michelle Oblack as well. And so what's unique here is that we've got medical oncology, radiation oncology, and surgical oncology. So we can sort of, for the complicated cases, talk to the families with their pets and say, here's what each one can do alone, but each one often, just like in people, multimodality therapy, what the surgeons can do, and then followed up with radiation, and then if it's systemic disease, what we can offer in medical oncology. And then we have over here our uh, Doctor of Veterinary Science, or basically residents doing a research project. We've got Fernanda Montavani from Brazil. We have Jerome Calvalito from France. And we have Steve Patton from Ontario. Yeah. <laughs> And then we also have a radiation therapist. We have Laura Furness. We have our clinical trials coordinators coming later tonight, Kaya, who actually is a cancer researcher, did a PhD up in Brenda Coomer's lab before joining us. And she does clinical trials coordination and is also our tumor banker as well. I have some forms here on some of the trials that we have going on, and we're very interested in that. And Kaya also runs our website. So we have a website there showing you what different trials are available. Some of them as incentives for uh, clients, and some are more just helping uh, as well. We also have our clinical counselor, Bojena, who's going to talk to you as well. And again, she's supported by the Pet Trust. Come on in, grab some dinner. We're just sort of going over the stuff we have, John, on who's who here at OVC. Pathobiology, we have a number of pathologists. And tonight, we've got Rob Foster here as well. And they're very helpful for us because when we're talking in rounds, we're sort of talking back and forth about what the tumor diagnosis is, also the margins and things like that. And for special stains, immunohistochemistry, Rob and Courtney and Jeff help us a lot with that as well. And we also have our technicians. And so we have here Vicky, Mel, and then not here today is Jerry, who's probably off doing a triathlon or something crazy like that. And so they're often, though, the people who are more meeting up with the pets and their families. So they are very much where the families are uh, invested with them on what's going to go on and how things are doing as well. So we have all that group that we've got here. And so that's what we look like on a typical day. And then what the other is also new is though the transformation that the Pet Trust made available of the building itself. And so fortunately, don't worry, we're just all looking at this one. There was a real construction team put this together. And so again, they redeveloped the area of the pathobiology. So who here has not, well, been to the Animal Cancer Center? OK, I see tours coming on afterwards. And so this is what it would look like in the schematic. But this is what it looks like in reality. And so what we've got is it's just next to uh, the small animal clinic, so out on College Avenue. So what we can do is advanced diagnostics, therapeutics, also counseling, and all education. So also undergraduate veterinarians and for postgraduate veterinarians as well. We have a number of research projects that Kaya is helping us with. One is the companion animal tumor sample bank, which continues on. And so you may hear of that more from the clients, meaning if a pet is going to surgery to have a tumor taken off, we're actually talking to the families ahead of time saying, well, most important part is going to go to Rob and his pathology team to find out what it is and then the margins to see did we get it all, but the rest of it may just be tossed away. And so we're asking, 
Could we instead take that sample and freeze that at negative 80 and also take some normal samples from their dog, some blood and urine as well, and freeze that? Doesn't really help their pet, but in future what it may do is help other pets if we come back and say a researcher comes along and asks us, do you have this target in dogs, say, with osteosarcoma? We can look in our tumor bank and say, yeah, that target is there. Let's try your novel agent. Or no, it's not there. Let's try a different type of disease. Or we may come along later and say, two dogs with osteosarcoma, one does really well and one does OK. We can come back and look at that and see what's different. So that's more for the future. The other thing, we do have some clinical trials going on, though. And Jerome has a study looking at cytokine levels in dogs with lymphoma. So he'll be looking for the pets coming in here, just collecting blood samples. We're going to be freezing that. And then Jerome's going to be working in Tony Mutzer's lab, looking at cytokine patterns to see if we can show anything that be biomarkers as well. And just walking in is Kaya, who is our tumor banker and our clinical trials coordinator. And she's the one who will be running or helping us run these trials. The other one you may have heard of in the press lately would be our oncolytic virus vaccine. And so that's a group at McMaster has a novel virus that actually attacks the cancer cells in the pet, but leaves the normal cells alone. And so we're looking there for cats with mammary carcinoma before it's surgically removed. And so what we're doing is offering standard of care surgery to remove that mammary carcinoma off the cat. But then in addition, we're offering oncolytic viruses. And that's actually funded by the Canadian Breast Cancer Foundation. So we're excited by the fact that they're thinking our pets are important enough that if we can show a positive difference there, they may take this oncolytic virus to people as well. And then we also have another one that's coming along, a novel agent, Paclovet, which is still coming through the regulation hurdles, but it will be for dogs with mammary carcinoma as well. And so also there will be new studies coming on. So again, uh, Kaya is keeping up on our website. We are also a member of the uh, NIH, National Institute of Health in America. We're their only international member of that consortium. And again, they're looking at different drugs that may help people in the future, but they're trying to see using dogs to see can we show a positive difference there. And again, we're looking at there may be a new study coming in the spring. So we'll make you available of that. So all of that is to try and basically give pets their best possible treatment to help the families deal with the cancers they've got and give them good quality of life. And then the other part of the equation here is also then trying to take things that we're losing, learning in the laboratory and take them over to the Labrador. So what questions do you guys have? Wow, a quiet group that is well fed. The other thing is that Tony and Brenda Coomer will be running a symposium in the spring. And we've got Dr. Nicola Mason coming from Pennsylvania. So just keep an eye on the website for that as well. And so a lot of the things we're doing here will be sponsored by the Pet Trust. I was going to have Bojena maybe just talk to you guys on what she can offer as a counselor. So Bojena is a counselor, and she is here supported by the Pet Trust. We have her here Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday around 10 o'clock to 3 o'clock. So I don't have her a lot of the time. It's just because she's supported by the Pest Trust, and that's sort of all the funding we have. But where Bojona is very helpful for our oncology group, she is a hospital-wide resource as well and helps with some other cases in the uh, Health Sciences Center as well. A little bit about my background. I'm the registered social worker and a psychotherapist. Uh, and I have done my undergrad at University of Waterloo and my grad at uh, Wolfert Hall University. I have a specialized training in cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, mindfulness, um, trauma, grief and bereavement. So what do I do here? One part, I work with clients. Um, so I provide direct um, individual counseling uh, for pet loss for grief in grief and bereavement. And the services are provided to all OVC clients, not only from ACC, but to all OVC clients. I as well provide support with cl when clients are struggling with making the decision when it comes to treatment and options. And um, I provide compassion care for clients when they are in extreme emotional distress or in crisis. And I have created and I run um, once a month a support group for uh, clients that um, they have lost or about to lose a pet. Um, so when clients are referred to my services, um, in situation when they are experiencing an extreme trauma or when they are in crisis, when they are not coherent, not able to make a sound decision, or in acute grief or in complex grief and bereavement. 
you can stop me at any time if you have any questions. So that's about the pet loss support group. Um, it um, happens right now once a month. And um, it's open to any OVC client uh, whose pet is either terminally ill or uh, has died. Saying that it's not completely true because as well uh, we accept um, some people, some clients, that they are not direct OVC clients due to special circumstances based on the individual basis. The same comes when it comes to counseling. Okay. Um, I provide as well support for staff, faculty and students in terms of offering consultation and support uh, when it comes to communication and strategies with clients, uh, euthanasia, uh, challenging cases, compassion fatigue, and provide a debrief. What's on my desk? I'm working on a um, uh, compassion fatigue workshop that will be open to all staff, faculty, and students, and OVC. And um, um, the workshop will address the, issue, the stages of grief and loss, and as well the emotional impact on loss on clients. I will, uh, what you're going to learn in that workshop, you're going to leave the workshop with some techniques uh, that can be used when working with clients in a very um, heightened sense of emotion. And as well, um, the outcome, I hope, um, from the workshop that you're going to take with you will be to be able to recognize and manage uh, clients, your own emotions um, when it comes to detachment, issue of detachment, which is quite often called compassion fatigue. Okay, if you have any questions. Okay, you're very quiet. Thank you. Well, thanks so much, Paul and the gang, for allowing me to uh, take a few minutes of tonight. I just wanted to share some, some cases where we use minimally invasive surgery for oncology. And I think this is something that our service is uh, just really happy and excited that we're able to offer these techniques more and more as the years have gone on. And I think you know, we're able to offer these techniques to all of our patients, but I think that the oncology um, cases and these patients, maybe they have a, a particular um, ad advantage for those cases. Some of them present to us in some real uh, metabolic compromise, uh, cancer cachexia, uh, for example. Uh, I think in some instances, some owners may not be as interested in doing surgery. However, when we talk about minimally invasive techniques, they're certainly um, keen on doing that. and a lot more interested and in, in per, per more, per more likely to maybe pursue surgery for the treatment of their pet's cancer. And finally, I think there's so many different um, advantages that if we want to take the whole night and talk about it, we can, but I don't know if that will go over that well. But you have a hockey game later tonight. <laughs> oh yes, I need to go home and hydrate. Uh, and so uh, a lot of these techniques can provide many advantages for our, our patients, even open, even over open surgical techniques. So uh, just for a few minutes, I just wanted to uh, share a few cases that, that we've been involved with. So this is a Jersey. She is just a beautiful mixed breed dog. And she had a little altercation with a, a feline friend, I think, correct? When um, she was young and she ended, up a, she ended up losing her eye, but that hasn't stopped her for the last seven or eight years. And so She's been doing well since that little incident. However, she started developing PUPD. She had a pot-bellied appearance, became alopecic, and uh, obviously those are signs consistent with Cushing's disease or, disease or hyperadrenal corticism. And uh, we, we did an abdominal ultrasound, or that was done at the family veterinarian, and um, that revealed an adrenal mass. And that obviously, as you guys all know, it's the least common or the lesser common uh, originator for hyperadrenal corticism. So with that adrenal dependent hyperadrenal corticism, we were uh, interested, or the owners were interested in having that removed surgically as a treatment for the disease. So um, the way to do that using minimally invasive surgery is laparoscopy. And laparoscopic adrenalectomy is kind of standard of care in humans and in, in us. Several advantages that laparoscopic uh, techniques can provide, especially pertaining to adrenalectomy, is 
uh, shorter hospital stays, reduced analgesic requirements postoperatively, reduced incidences of pneumonia, reduced incidence of sepsis, and the list goes on actually. We're, we're not quite there in veterinary medicine. There's a recent study on laparoscopic adrenalectomy that has shown uh, reduced hospital stay, shorter surgical time. But I think once we get more and more of these cases under our belt, we'll certainly see some more advantages with this technique. So just want to uh, briefly chat about laparoscopy. Many of you are, are I'm, sh I'm sure, familiar with these techniques, but just to provide a general overview. So definition of laparoscopy is exploration of the abdomen and its organs with a rigid endoscope. And what we do is we gain abdominal access with a small incision. We create a working space by insufflating CO2 into the abdomen. You'll see why CO2 and maybe not oxygen as we move on here. We insert other portals where we can put instruments into the abdomen, and all of those instruments are controlled extracorporeally, meaning outside of the body, and we view that on a monitor. So here's an example of one of these rigid endoscopes. We can have them angled or straight on. The angled scope will allow us to look around the corner uh, in the abdomen or even in the thorax, so it definitely has some advantages. Abdominal access, I have a video to show you just to um, demonstrate how we do that, but briefly, after we make our stab insert, uh, incision, we insert one of these trochar cannula assemblies, and, and on this diagram, it's got a valve, and that's where we attach some hosing that can insufflate CO2 into the abdomen, and that's what allows us to create a working space inside the abdomen. So here's an example, uh, an example of some different trochar cannula assemblies. This is more for working in the thorax. It's got some uh, threads on it, so it allows us to uh, screw it in, in between the intercostal or in the intercostal space and prevent it from backing out. Okay, so uh, just a quick video to uh, demonstrate how we put that portal in initially. Please interrupt me at any time if you have any questions or, or comments. So uh, we're just making a, a, an incision just about a, about a centimeter at the level of the umbilicus uh, and patient's lying on his back, thorax is to the bottom of the screen back end is toward the top of the screen. Just made a small stab incision uh, to the level of the, of the linea alba. We're putting some stay sutures on either side of the linea. And then here's our trochar cannula with the CO2 hosing that's hooked up, all set to go in. We elevate the, the body wall because the spleen is right underneath this area. We certainly don't want to traumatize that. Probably one of the biggest complications in, in human laparoscopy is traumatizing the spleen on insertion. So we made our stab incision, and then we, we gently place our trochar cannula, and then there's the initial look that we, we get as we're going in. And then uh, once we've got access into the abdomen, we insufflate with CO2, uh, and then we, we put a, at least one, up to as many as three more instrument portals in, depending on the procedure that we're doing. And so the way we do that, it's laparoscopic guided, we have to be very careful when we put these portals in because we don't want to traumatize any organs, obviously. Spleen is a big factor there, GI tract. And so we, you have to be careful because obviously this is quite a sharp trocar to get through the body wall. And uh, once we place these instrument trocars, we try to get them in as soon as possible so that we can start our procedure. And so there we have it. Okay, and all of, we're really lucky here. We've got some great equipment. We've got a nice uh, high definition monitor that we can uh, view all of our procedures on. A uh, variety of different uh, boxes that you can see here. One is for controlling the CO2 pressure. One is for controlling the light source. Another is for uh, actually recording and taking pictures of all our videos so that I can show all of you and our clients. They really like that. So back to Jersey, so we wanted to uh, understand or figure out whether we could do laparoscopy for Jersey's adrenalectomy. Uh, we knew that her tumor was on the left side, it was in the left adrenal gland, and we were happy about that because the right side is more intimately associated with the caudal vena cava. So we're already happy that it was a left-sided tumor. We did a CT scan to understand how close it was to the, the kidney. So this is just a movie of the CT scan. We're just gonna come to the action spot right about here, so I'll just pause it. And so, kidney is, is, is right here. This is the left kidney. We've got the liver, we've got the spleen, colon, cross-section through the colon. And one of the, 
the biggest things that's been found in doing laparoscopic adrenalectomy in dogs is success with that is, is uh, increased if your mass is far away from the renal vein. And so that's one thing with the CT scan, what we really try to get an idea of. So we've got, we've got our kidney here now, and this is our adrenal mass, and there's our renal vein. So it's, it's fairly close. However, we do have a nice gap in here, and we thought, okay, this is, this is a great candidate for us to attempt a laparoscopic adrenalectomy. So what we, what we did for Jersey is we obviously talked to uh, their owners about this technique. One thing that I always mention to the owners is that even though we're going to attempt minimally invasive technique, we're always prepared to open, to do an open surgery, to convert to that. And we never consider that a failure. We always think that this is going to happen, if it does, for the best interest of, our, of the patient that we're working on. I think that's very important that the owner hears that. It's also karma for me, too. For all of us, we feel that if we don't review that or don't discuss that with the owner, well, it's going to happen. And then, you know, communication is, is breakdowns can, can never end in uh, something good. So for Jersey, we, we attempted, we started off to do a, a laparoscopic uh, technique. We used, uh, for Jersey, I have a picture here of a, a lateral approach. We used three, a three-portal technique for Jersey. So the middle portal contained the camera. We had a, a vessel sealing device, which you'll see just sh uh, shortly in the uh, caudal portal, and then an instrument in the cranial portal. We, we knew we could have placed the fourth portal if we needed it, but we actually uh, were able to do the procedure with, with three portals. So here's um, a video of the procedure. get it to play, apologize. <coughs> oh, sorry about this. Let's see if I can get it to work. Yeah. Ah, thank you, Dr. Oblak, always saving me. Oh. Okay, so, thank you. So, uh, just to orient you, we're, you know, the jersey's in lateral recumbency here, and then here is the left kidney, and then here is this gargantuan adrenal mass. And it was really, I mean, we, we knew it was going to be big just based on the CT, but we, we, weren't, we weren't expecting it to be that large. So, and I must tell you too, this video is sped up a bit. We don't, I don't work that fast. I wish I did. Uh, so we, we have a, a cranial pole adrenal gland tumor here, and we're using what's called a vessel sealing device. It's uh, one of a, a great tool that we've got that allows us to do a lot of these minimally invasive procedures. And this vessel sealing device, what it does is it seals whatever is present within the jaws of this instrument. It has, it's able to feed back to the main uh, box that's sitting in our OR, and then a bell goes off, and then we're out, it tells us that what's in those jaws has been sealed, and we can fire a blade through that, which is contained all within the same device. And so that's very, uh, very helpful for us. And it's also a great dissector. It's got blunt tips, as you can see here. And uh, you know, the biggest vessel that we have to worry about is the phrenico-abdominal vessel as we were doing this. Uh, the vessel sealing device made this um, very easily or, or helped with, with us attenuating this vessel. And let me fast forward this a little bit. So there's a, a view now as we progress with our dissection. It's, it's almost all gone. The, the phrenico abdominal vessel is the big one to watch out for as we're um, trying to dissect the adrenal gland out. It's the same thing when we do an open adrenalectomy. And uh, the vessel sealing device was great. We didn't, it, we didn't have to put in another portal to uh, allow us to remove that. I don't know if there's any other questions. Okay, so we're just finishing up our dissection. Now the big thing is, is that when we remove this 
and it goes with, with any type of, whether it's an adrenal gland, a lung tumor, any other type of neoplasia, we want to be absolutely sure that we don't contaminate the site that we're extracting this tumor from. So we enlarged our, um, our caudal portal. Actually, we didn't even have to enlarge it. We inserted into our caudal portal what's called a specimen retrieval bag. And so here's the edge of the specimen retrieval bag. So we're just pulling that into the abdomen. We want to place our adrenal tumor into that bag and then exteriorize that because we don't want to create any port site metastasis if we were to pull that tumor out just through the edges of the skin. So the adrenal tumor goes into the bag and then uh, you know, we pull that out and that's what we're left with for Jersey. So there, that was the port site incision where we had our camera our third portal, and we're really happy about that. I think with uh, Cushing's dogs, obviously they're at a much higher risk for surgical site infections, wound healing, and we were able to really minimize the incisions on, on Jersey. And she's do, uh, done well. We, we did this about three weeks ago, and, and so she continues to do well. Okay, can I do another case, Paul, or no? Okay, I'll, I'll go uh, a little bit faster for this one. Okay, so Blakey, Blakely, no, Blakey, I'm sorry. Sorry for the typo, yeah, Blakey. So she was a, uh, sorry, he is a, a lovely Jack Russell Terrier, and he's one of our, and continues to be one of our radiation therapy patients. And uh, he's having radiation therapy for an infiltrative lipoma. And during the staging process for this infiltrative lipoma, uh, we discovered a, splenic mass. Now, the mass was quite small, as you can see here. It was uh, 1.2 by 1.5 centimeters, but we, we weren't sure. And, you know, in discussion with uh, Blakey's owners, you know, they were very keen to remove this. And we thought, well, because we're not sure exactly what this is, it would be great if we could use minimally invasive techniques instead of a full open laparotomy to remove this spleen. And uh, wanted to introduce to you guys the concept of single port laparoscopy. This is something that has been done in humans for 15, 20 years. It's now starting to uh, increase in veterinary medicine. It's kind of the evolution of laparoscopy. You saw in Jersey's case, we use multiple ports, and there's a trend in, in human laparoscopy and now in veterinary laparoscopy as well to try to reduce all of those ports to come in through one single device. Now in humans, the uh, you know, the incentive to do this was try to minimize scars. And this SILS port, which, which is seen here, it's just a, a spongy port with three uh, cannula that can be placed through there, and then a tube that goes through to allow for your CO2 insufflation. Now, the trend was to allow for scarless surgery in humans because that can be placed through the umbilicus. Our patients, thankfully, they don't seem to worry as much about having scars, but it's still, you know, if we're trying to minimize soft tissue injury, Etc. cetera, for, for the you know, benefits of MIS, well, this is something that's certainly taking off in veterinary laparoscopy as well. So we, we took a, a single port approach for Blakey and uh, his splenectomy. So there's the SILS port inserted. This isn't in, in Blakey, but it's in another patient. So uh, here's the intraoperative video of this splenectomy. One of the things that we do in, in all of our oncologic patients all of our patients, particularly in our oncologic patients, is to do a really thorough explore. And I haven't shown all of that in this video. We're just taking a liver biopsy uh, at this point, and we, we really had a good look around. I think the, you know, it's obvious to you guys now is that the magnification that you can get with, with our endoscope is tremendous. We can really see places within the abdomen that we don't see sometimes even in an open procedure. And so here we're, we're starting the splenectomy. And you know, with our SILS port, one of the challenges is that all of the three ports uh, instruments are coming in through the same port. And so we can really get a lot of instrument clashing. And so there is a little bit of a, of a trick to doing this. But uh, you know, overall, the, the learning curve is not that steep. And so again, we're using our friend, the ligature, this vessel sealing device. Uh, you know, you can see now why we use CO2, not oxygen. We'd have an issue if we were insufflating the abdomen with oxygen when we use the ligature. 
Now once, um, you know, we're coming across the hilus of the spleen with, uh, with the ligature. Just fast forward it a little bit here again. <coughs> and it's important that when we use case selection for doing this technique, I think the, it's not that common in our caseload anyways that we see small splenic masses. We usually see large ones. Those cases are probably not amenable to uh, laparoscopic splenectomy simply because manipulating the spleen in the mass, it would probably result in hemorrhage of that mass or, or other complications. And so there's the spleen. It's been completely uh, divided from its hilus. And then uh, once we've, um, you know, we've removed the sills uh, port, which was at this level, and now we're removing the spleen. So that can all be done uh, through one incision. <coughs> so we've extracted the spleen now. That's kind of what it looks like. There's the mass, small, small mass. And then there's our closure. And so we're really pleased that we're able to do this for Blakey. Uh, the diagnosis came back as an indolent lymphoma. And so uh, we're hoping that this is curative for Blakey. Correct, guys? Yes. And uh, yeah, those are, those are my cases. Happy to uh, answer any questions if you have them. I have to put a plug in for uh, the Veterinary Endoscopic Society. This is a society that's really taking off. And if you have interests uh, in these types of uh, techniques, please uh, visit our website and uh, this is our annual conference. So happy to uh, take any questions if there are any. Okay, thanks. So with someone like Blakey that you just saw that has an infiltrated lipoma that Val Poyer is treating with uh, radiation, but we do the abdominal ultrasound just to see as we're going to do such an involved treatment up here to see if there's anything else. And as Meet was saying, that's when we found the splenic mass, which nicely with the minimally invasive, in this case, came up an indolent lymphoma, and we go on from there. Not related at all to the infiltrative lipoma, just unfortunately a second tumor that he's developed, but at least something that's going to be manageable by splenectomy. So we have... Fernando's got a case as well, but my question for the group, this is a fork in the road. Do people here have cases as well? Because we can, we've sort of got some cases here in reserve, but I didn't know if there would be any cases you guys want to discuss while we have a radiation oncologist, a surgeon, our pathologist, residents, we've got technicians, we've got a counselor in the room, and we have lasagna and coca but okay. okay, well then I guess our next speaker will be Dr. Fernanda Montavani. As I said, she's a graduate from Brazil. She was in Wisconsin and did an internship at Missouri before we grabbed her here. She was an oncology intern with us before, and that's supported by the Pet Trust, and now she has stayed on, and she is our uh, final year of her DVSC in uh, medical oncology. Fernanda. So I have this case to share with you guys of um, radiation therapy, and then we can talk a little bit about how we set up our patients for radiation therapy, a little bit of our equipment for you to understand a little bit more. I'm not sure if anyone here has referred a patient that had any kind of radiation therapy yet. Anyone worked with that? So maybe we can clarify a little bit of how we use that equipment and all of that. So River was a seven-year-old female spade Sharpe. She initially presented to her family veterinarian in July last year uh, with the pyometra. And then during surgery, they did identify a splenic mass, which they did not feel comfortable removing. So they dealt with the pyometra and um, didn't do anything with the spleen at that time. And then during anesthesia was um, another concern that the owner raised. Oh, by the way, um, she's been having some um, oral pain at home. So during anesthesia, they actually identified this firm swelling, diffuse um, kind of area on the soft palate. And as a bi uh, an incisional biopsy came back as a malignant melanoma. So then therefore, she came here to OVC. Uh, so she was recovering well from her spay when she came here, was on meloxicam and tramadol. Um, she had some mild swelling of the hoofs bilaterally, being a Sharpe at the time of uh, presentation, and a bit of a fever, so possibly unrelated. And uh, <coughs> nothing too exciting on her minimum database. So doing her staging, her thoracic radiographs were normal, and then on the abdominal ultrasound, here are some images of her uh, splenic mass, so this kind of heterogeneous area and a hypoechoic area within the spleen. 
So a couple of days later, the plan was to have her back for an oral examination under anesthesia, perform a head CT scan and finish the staging, as well as performing a splenectomy. So luckily, her spleen was just a hematoma, so therefore we were left with one problem to address. So here are some pictures of her tumor. I don't, I wonder if we dim the lights a little bit, if you can see that a little bit better, Paul, because here is, as you can see, her hard palate going to the soft palate, so the pigmented mouth here. But this area where the arrow is uh, pointing is this just irregular, firm, very black tissue, right here that you can see. Uh, so that was where her melanoma was. Here are a couple of picture of pictures of her CT scan. So here, uh, a couple of transverse views. So here, cranial to caudal, her sinuses, her oral cavity. So basically, all this mass here within her soft palate and uh, a little bit of bone lysis here throughout, towards her nasal cavity. And on this view, you can see quite, quite large tumor. So um, we also performed the lymph node cytology, <coughs> which all those islands of um, melanin and um, malignant melanocytes in there, so a metastatic um, lymph node. Um, so as we know, uh, canine oral melanomas are very common, more of an older dog um, disease, um, and then they arise from the melanocytes, but um, and some of the breeds that are predisposed include the um, Sharpe and Chow Chows. And just like any other oral tumor, they can present with increased salivation, dysphagia, halitosis, etc. Et uh, we do know that those tumors are locally invasive and have a high metastatic rate. And the two big places that we think about metastasis with this disease are the regional lymph nodes and then the lungs. Uh, and most of the time they're going to be uh, pigmented, like those pictures and how was the case with River, but they can also be amelanotic and look more pinkish. And it can be often hard to diagnose those tumors. So uh, if, we, if you're getting uh, biopsies of an oral mass and either the pathologist is, not, is having a hard time committing to a specific diagnosis or if it's showing features of more round cell tumor, more mesenchymal tumor, you know, that, that's definitely something to keep in mind. We call them the great pretender. Uh, so often we have to use uh, immunohistochemistry to help us differentiate. And those are some of the uh, stains that we can use in terms of our panel. Uh, some negative prognostic factors, tumor size. So two centimeters is the cutoff for the majority of our oral tumors. And also the mitotic index that you're gonna see on your pathology report. So if it's uh, four is the cutoff in 10 high power fields, and you've gotta pay attention with how they're reporting that because sometimes the pathologist is gonna give a total number of um, mitosis that they saw, or sometimes they're gonna specify specifically all oh, mitotic index four per 10 high power field. Uh, because with those tumors, with them being quite aggressive, you can easily get to, you know, um, way higher numbers of mitotic figures. Um, so another note here is just in terms of with oral melanoma and other solid tumors that lymph node palpation is not a very sensitive um, method for detecting metastasis, so we always recommend aspirating those lymph nodes. Okay, so in terms of the local control modalities for oral melanoma, we know that surgery in the cases that we're able to is gonna be um, the treatment of choice. Uh, we do recommend a wide excision and in the oral cavity that's often gonna be associated with removing some kind of underlying bone to get your one to two centimeter margins. And oftentimes we excise the lymph nodes as well. So when do we use radiation therapy? In the case, uh, River is a very good example for that. So tumors are unresectable, tumors are metastatic, and if surgery is not elected by the owners, we know that functionally dogs re do really well with oral surgery, partial mandibulectomies, maxillectomies, but obviously there's a, a cosmetic um, aspect to that surgery and could be declining at some point. Uh, the options that we have for treating the metastatic disease potential, what well we are using though, uh, here at OVC and 
probably most oncology practices is immunotherapy with the melanoma vaccine. So this is labeled for dogs that uh, have the local disease um, well controlled and you're using that in a microscopic setting. Uh, and that's one of the problems where the true benefit, so the true efficacy of this vaccine is still yet to be determined. Um, however, it's very safe. So we don't really get side effects from it. And we know that standard chemotherapy is not really good for melanoma. So uh, that's what we've been using yet to be determined if it's uh, causing a prolonged, um, a significant increase in the survival of those patients. Uh, we have a feeling that some cases must be working, but again, there's always gonna be that percentage of patients that would do well just with the local control. Uh, various chemotherapy protocols have been reported, but with not very great efficacy. So we know that untreated dogs, so when we diagnose those dogs, typically without treatment, a couple of months is the expected survival, and they usually uh, get euthanized because of the local disease progression. Now, surgery alone, we know that the dogs that have small tumors, um, they can have a prolonged survival, and especially if they don't have lymph node metastasis, right? So how good is radiation for oral melanoma? So it's actually quite good. Um, we have a good response rate, um, 83 to 100 percent, and uh, is on the literature, and up to 70 percent complete response. We usually say at least a 70 percent complete response when we're treating the growth setting. Now those are um, that's even when you're treating large tumors like um, river, and I think we might have some responders that we'll show later here about on, on a case, another case. Uh, we do know the radiation works best in a microscopic disease setting for sure, uh, but it's one of those things that uh, we can help those dogs even with a very large tumor. Uh, two approaches when we're doing radiation, curative intent versus palliative protocol. In respect with the oral melanoma itself, we know that it's a tumor that responds better to a higher dose per fraction, so that's a more of a palliative type of protocol, so typically about five treatments once a week or four treatments once a week. Uh, and we use our linear accelerator to deliver this, um, this treatment. Now, what is very interesting about the current machine that we have, it's, it can provide this very conformal radiation therapy. And we'll have a couple of pictures to illustrate that. But basically, uh, the old unit that we had here with the cobalt unit would pretty much deliver radiation in squares. And then you would have to manually just block certain areas uh, to deliver that. So as you can imagine, in areas such as the head and neck, uh, that was quite limiting on what we could safely deliver to those patients and sparing structures like the eye, the brain, uh, and et cetera. So right now we have the state of the art kind of as good as it gets in terms of really conforming the radiation, uh, which is what we call IMRT, so intensity modulated, modu modulated radiation therapy. Uh, so those are some pictures here to kind of illustrate on this human patient. Uh, so the red area represents where uh, the radiation is actually, most of the radiation is delivered to the patient. So on the left hand here, we have what the more, more conventional radiation, so it's a bigger square, so more structures are in the radiation field, versus on the right with the IMRT, you can minimize that and conform to various shapes and forms and really target tumors in very tricky areas. And this is actually a picture of what uh, are what we call the multi-leaf collimator. So that's the um, technology behind this equipment that allows us to shape, this can be shaped in any kind of form that Dr. Poirier tells the machine to. Uh, it does require the patient to have a CT scan, uh, which is used um, when we're planning the, the radiation we do put the patients in the exact position that they're gonna receive the treatments. So we have a few different devices here, and the goals of those devices are immobilization, because then that can be repeatable and reproducible with every treatment. So this is uh, for everything that's more on the head and neck, they need that. So this block here actually attaches on the um, radiation couch. Um, and then this is a little mold, a little moulage that it's, um, 
made for each patient when they get their initial CT scan. And this is a little mattress that's a VAC lock mattress. So this deflates, you place the patient, the anesthetized patient on that, you're happy with the setup, and then all the limbs and all the body's position on the way that you're gonna need that patient to be, and then you just um, suction the air out and the vacuum locks that. And then that stays locked like that, so every, for every treatment, the patient can be placed in that same position, if that makes sense. So with this kind of device, our margin of error is approximately two millimeters. So we're very happy about that. Uh, so here are some pictures of river being planned here on the little vac lock and then certain marks, you know, the team makes just to make sure it's always reproducible. And then not only we use those devices to make sure they're always in the same position, after everything's positioned, uh, the patient gets a quick CT scan where then the, the image of today's CT can be placed on top of the image of the planning CT scan to make sure that no adjustments need to be made. And if there's a little bit of an adjustment, you can also tell the machine to go where it needs to go. That makes sense? So what kind of side effects do we see with radiation uh, therapy? Because that's certainly something the clients might be asking. So we have to think about the acute side effects and the late side effects. Um, acute side effects, they occur <coughs> during or shortly after the radiation protocol, and it's gonna be the itis, so all the inflammation. So, uh, and it's only what's gonna be in the radiation field, right? So in the oral mucosa, you may have mucositis, you may have um, KCS, blepharitis, conjunctivitis. On the skin, we have alopecias with moist desquamation. We have some pictures here. And you may have some diarrhea if your GI tract is in the field and stuff like that. So basically, radiation side effects are self-limiting. So they will heal on their own. Usually two to four weeks is the time um, that it takes. And we have to prevent self-trauma with uh, things such as e-collar. If the patient is licking or rubbing that area, then it's not gonna heal. And we generally just support them with uh, pain control and antibiotics uh, until they're fully healed. So obviously, this is kind of worst case scenario, where it's, well, uh, very graphic or very severe side effects. This is a large field of the patient that had um, a subcutaneous hemangiosarcoma. So, you know, obviously when you have a large area, a large surface on the body uh, being affected, that can affect their quality of life. So, you know, for some days there, uh, this patient needed quite a bit of pain medications, but now it's, once it was all healed, uh, it, he did great. Um, so smaller areas here, so that's very oozy, the moist desquamation, same on the face and on the limb here. This is how it looks as the skin is starting to heal, so that kind of pink, very thin tissue starting to heal, but looks really healthy underneath. And that's a patient about, uh, two patients two months after radiation therapy, so then the skin gets a little bit darker, less thin, and starts growing. And then on the long term, that's gonna be related to the tissues that are more slowly proliferating. And those are the ones that uh, if we were to have very bad late side effects, um, that, you know, that, that can be a problem because it can be things like bone necrosis, uh, fibrosis, and et cetera. And that's where this very precise technology that allows us to spare more normal tissue is very advantageous and makes us be able to treat areas that were not possible to be treated before. So uh, basically they occur months to years after radiation, but on the day to day, what we see really, it's more on the skin. So changes on the pigmentation of the skin and something called leukotrichia, so the hair growing, growing back white. So those are how they look. So that's a dark coat patient with uh, the hair growing white on the radiation field, and then uh, a more, um, light coated patient with just more dark, dark pigment on the face. That's basically, uh, in terms of River, um, she, we were able to improve her clinical signs for a few months. Um, however, and we also treated her with the melanoma vaccine. Um, so she did well for a few months, but unfortunately, you know, uh, in the fall, uh, her disease did progress and um, she was euthanized in December. So about six months after we met her. Uh, any questions at this point? Any questions about radiation?
you have any questions on any two PV plants for radiation when we announce one right here or radiation oncology? Mm -hmm. And uh, Jerome is going to present a case. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. So I'm going to present you a case of uh, a dog with sublingual ectopic thyroid tumor. So Starsky is a 10-year-old male neuter Shih Tzu uh, who had a growing mass in the cranial ventral neck for 10 months uh, that had reached the size of a golf ball. And uh, the referring clinic uh, performed uh, cytology that was suggestive of epithelial neoplasia. Uh, and he had also a history of Cushing's disease, but barely clinical, so was just prescribed silagilin there and was doing well. He had initially uh, blood work that, was, that revealed uh, elevation of ALP and platelets that was consistent with his Cushing. Uh, the total T4 was normal as well as the urinalysis. So at the referring clinic, they attempted surgical excision of the mass, but uh, once there, they found the mass was more invasive than anticipated, attached to the larynx, and was deemed unresectable, so they just closed and referred uh, Starsky to uh, the Animal Cancer Center here. So on physical exam here, uh, Starsky was doing well. He had this large scar on the cranial ventral neck, with below that a firm, barely movable mass that was five centimeter at the longest diameter and was really central um, in the larynx region. And <coughs> on palpation, the peripheral lymph nodes were normal. So we did chest x-rays and abdominal ultrasound as part of the classic staging. Um, they were both unremarkable. So we then proceeded with the CT of neck and thorax. And as you can see on this lateral view, uh, so head is here, uh, thorax is there. Um, we have this mass, heterogeneous, with some mineralizations in there that was really at the base of the tongue and closely related to the larynx. We have other views. And as you can see, it's really central in the neck uh, on this dorsoventral view with still those extensive mineralizations and on this uh, transverse view uh, we find this mass and those two white spots are uh, two bones of the larynx and in fact the mass was destroying uh, a specific bone of the larynx called basihyoid bone and that's why there was this uh, bone lysis here. And if we go more caudally, we could find here uh, on both sides of the trachea the normal thyroid glands that really look uh, un symmetrical uh, with no abnormalities. So we repeated under the same anesthesia the cytology and it came back as uh, thyroid carcinoma. This is a picture uh, of uh, cytology, so it, it looked like that. It's not the cytology of Starsky, but it looked the same. Uh, and we did a cytology of the nodes as well, because on CT they were mildly enlarged, but it came back uh, clean, no evidence of metastasis. So we had a diagnosis of invasive basihyoid ectopic thyroid carcinoma with no evidence of gross metastasis. So the plan for Starsky was to do uh, radiation therapy because it was uh, too invasive to be surgically removed. Uh, and for thyroid tumors in general, uh, we try to do curative protocols because it works better than palliative. And for Starsky, we did 15 daily fractions, Monday to Friday, so three weeks in a row. And the mass shrank significantly. And after uh, the radiation, we did some chemotherapy with carboplatin every three weeks. And he's still uh, on the protocol. He's not done yet. I think he's going to receive the fourth dose soon. And we're going to monitor every three months uh, the classic monitoring for uh, metastatic development. So he's doing better now. Uh, actually, he was, uh, he was not clinical from the, this mass. It was really an incidental finding. So 
Ectopic thyroid tissue uh, is quite common in dogs and generally speaking in mammals. Uh, in one study on necropsy, 50% of age-old dogs had ectopic tissue. And it can, you can find it everywhere between the base of the tongue uh, and the heart, with the most common locations, well, the tongue, obviously. The hyoid apparatus seems to be uh, quite frequently um, affected. The neck, in general, including the trachea and the cranial mediastinum, heart, and aorta have been reported as well. But luckily, the neoplastic transformation is a rare event, and it's, it's uh, suspected to be as infrequent as for the normal thyroid glands. Uh, predominantly, like the orthotopic location, we find carcinoma, so malignant tumors in those ectopic tissues. <coughs> And it has been reported in dogs uh, in the heart. So here you have a picture of a thyroid tumor uh, within the heart. Uh, cranial mediastinum, here a dog with a huge mediastinal mass that was a thyroid carcinoma. And the sublingual slash hyoid location. Uh, and in one study, it comprised 7.5% of the thyroid tumors. One important thing is in terms of biologic behavior, it's very similar compared to the normal location. Uh, there was one recent study that questioned that and found maybe the metastatic potential was less than for the uh, classic thyroid location. Uh, but it's just one study. The number of dogs were low, so it has to be confirmed. For those tumors, uh, it's important to uh, perform imaging uh, to screen for the ectopic tissue uh, or to stage for uh, involvement of lymph nodes, uh, metastatic disease. And there is no real uh, standardization in the imaging devices, but we can use thoracic radiographs useful for uh, screening for metastases. Cervical ultrasound, which is useful for the classic location uh, to assess, to confirm that it originates from uh, the thyroid gland and uh, to look at the local invasiveness and the regional lymph nodes. CT scan that we did on uh, Starsky that is very useful for both local invasiveness and screening for metastases. Scintigraphy, especially useful to detect ectopic tissue um, less, it can also be used for, uh, to screen for metastases, but uh, actually it's less sensitive than chest X-rays to uh, detect metastases. So we prefer uh, chest X-rays. And the more recent and less available for us, PET-CT, which is now the standard, of, the standard in uh, human medicine. But before, the, before that, uh, the standard was CT scan. The treatment options are the same uh, compared to the orthotopic thyroid tumors, with surgery remaining the gold standard for uh, focal mass. And it's usually a marginal excision due to the location in the neck or even at the base of the heart. And in the specific case of, uh, high, of basi hyoid location, uh, like Starsky, uh, we, have to do, we would have to do a partial hyoidectomy if it was possible. And a recent study showed that the morbidity was very low, surprisingly, if, even if you remove significant part of the uh, hyoid apparatus. And the dogs have very good outcome. The median survival times for uh, ectopic as well as orthotopic uh, thyroid tumors is around three years just with surgery. The second best choice for local management is external beam radiation therapy uh, with curative intent protocol like for Starsky, three weeks in a row. The median survival time is two to three years, so still pretty good. And we have also less intense protocol, palliative protocol that we uh, may use, for example, if the dog has uh, pulmonary metastatic disease. And the median survival time is still more than a year with just the palliative protocol. In terms of systemic treatments, uh, chemotherapy is still kind of controversial. The response rate is uh, 
lower than for uh, radiation with 30-50% partial response, but it's usually short uh, term, like less than six months in many cases. The newer tyrosine kinase inhibitors, so Paleidia, Kinavet, um, there was one study that showed 27% partial response, 53% stable disease for an overall biologic activity of 80% and sustained for six months. Radioiodine is the last systemic treatment and um, is quite promising in humans. It's the standard adjuvant therapy after surgery to address metastatic disease and local residual um, disease. And uh, for in dogs, for stage two to three, uh, the median survival times was uh, around two years. With metastatic disease, it was around a year. So in conclusion, the, we, have, uh, we can frequently find ectopic thyroid tissue. Hopefully, it's in the majority of cases microscopic, not interfering with normal function, and the risk for cancerization is uh, very low. The sublingual wall slash basic hyoid location is more frequent than uh, previously thought with two recent studies in the past few years, uh, two case series. And uh, imaging is very useful to screen for that and stage the disease for metastasis. For metastasis. Uh, the treatments are similar compared to the orthotopic tumors and the outcome is also probably similar may be better with less metastasis, but it, it has to be confirmed. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Yes, sir. The data you showed for I131 for E1? Yeah. Does it matter for I131 whether those are functional tumors or not functional in the dog to get that treatment? Um, so functional, it depends on what you mean by functional. Like in terms of radioiodine, functional tumor doesn't mean hyperthyroid. So that's important to know uh, because dogs with uh, euthyroid uh, or hyperthyroidism uh, can respond uh, well to radioiodine. So they don't need to be hyperthyroid to respond well, but they have the tumors have to be functional in the sense that they have to, update, to, take, uh, to take up the, the radioiodine. So before doing radioiodine to know if the dog is a good candidate, uh, we have to do scintigraphy to see if the tumor is taking up the uh, contrast product. If yes, then he's a good candidate. And they, uh, the data um, th that uh, mentions the two years and one year, they just, uh, they did scintigraphy for all the dogs uh, before doing this treatment, it's mandatory. So they were functional in the sense that they uh, were able to take up the, uh, the radio iodine, yeah. But there were dogs hyperthyroid that did well and dogs with uh, thyroidism that did well as well, so it's not a it's not a criteria to be hyperthyroid. Can we segue into our next person then? Which would be Dr. Daniel Richardson. So we're going to talk about Cody, one of our favorite patients, a, and you can see why. So Cody, unfortunately, was a nine-year-old male neuter golden retriever who initially presented to the OBC emergency service last March. And he had nonspecific history of about a few days of lethargy really astute parents who are not a wait and see kind of family. So had taken him in to um, the referring veterinarian uh, who really had found just maybe a bit of a pendulous abdomen, a bit of a pot belly to his physical examination. But again, as I said, very proactive, actually had performed uh, an abdominal ultrasound right away. So what they found was a pretty scant amount of peritoneal effusion and splenic masses. So of course, when, you, when we see that on our eMERGE board coming in, golden retriever, abdominal effusion, splenic mass, we all had in our mind what this was going to be. Of course, this is going to be a hemangiosarcoma. Anyway, Cody lived to surprise us, thankfully. So 
basically when he arrived, we had done, it was late in the day, so we just did a point of care abdominal ultrasound, and there was a mild to moderate amount of abdominal effusion and the sort of multifocal splenic masses that we'll see afterwards. So an abdominal synthesis was performed right away to figure out, okay, is this a hemoabdomen? We have to go to surgery tonight, or can we wait and see? So the initial abdominal synthesis was done fairly caudal in the abdomen, and we saw a flash of frank blood, so we aborted that attempt and actually tried to go, thinking that we'd likely um, poke the spleen and then repeated that more cranially. And actually, it was a clear fluid, a transidate, uh, completely acellular on um, cytology. However, the following day, so Cody had come in pretty bright and alert, stable, no real significant abdomen, or, um, physical exam findings. The following day, we had seen um, him develop marked bruising of his ventral abdomen, bilaterally in his hind limb, bilateral hind limb edema. Uh, a CBC at that point, which had been previously normal, uh, showed a pretty significant thrombocytopenia, about 40 or so. Uh, he had developed an anemia in the low 30s, and we were now seeing mast cells in circulation, whereas the CBC the day earlier was unremarkable. So a little bit graphic, this had been a normal abdomen the day earlier, and we see that this bruising literally developed overnight. It was pretty shocking, actually. Um, he was, uh, you know, quiet, not comfortable, um, and you can see why that might be a little bit closer there. So we had done an abdominal ultrasound that day. <clears throat> the radiologist was a little reluctant to even put the probe on his abdomen, as you can see. Um, it looked so horrible. So there was that little um, pocket of fluid, oh. gosh, you guys are gonna think I'm like completely technically challenged here right now. There we are, nice. Okay, pocket of fluid um, adjacent to the spleen there. And then he had, um, basically, they, they don't come out that well in the images, but he had multiple um, um, splenic, uh, hypocoic splenic masses slash nodules. So a lot, we get used to seeing these a lot of the time, and sometimes, you know, they we may have the, feeling that they appear a little bit more benign, but his certainly were not looking like that. <clears throat> so basically, we were a little bit stuck at that moment. So essentially, we had seen that um, overnight, he had developed, as I said, the, the bilateral hind limb edema, uh, bruising of his ventral abdomen and hind limbs. He developed thrombocytopenia. His coagulation profile was essentially off the charts, not measurable. Um, and we had this, this new finding of mast cells in circulation. So the presumptive diagnosis was obviously a uh, splenic mast cell disease, <clears throat> which we recognize in the cat, but is not really reported as a primary finding in the dog. So we uh, decided to treat the treatable, and he was given, um, for a presumptive kind of state of DIC, he was given uh, treatment with fresh frozen plasma, and we started uh, treatment with steroids. Um, so he had an uh, immunosuppressive dose of dexamethasone and then gastroprotectants. Oh, and he was also on some hardcore Benadryl. So the following day, his coagulation times were actually readable. They were mildly elevated at that point. So, you know, whether it was the steroids, whether it was the fresh frozen plasma, we'll never know. Uh, so bone marrow aspirate was performed. And here we're fairly commonly doing a sternal bone marrow aspirate technique, which is a really handy tool. Um, you guys may or may not have heard Dr. Ogg speak about it at OVMA and so forth, but essentially just involves um, clipping of the sternum, the maneuvering of the sternum, sterile prep, obviously, and we use anywhere from a 22 to 20-gauge 20, 20 needle and essentially just seat your needle attached to your syringe with anticoagulant in it uh, in the manubrium and, and um, aspirate, and as soon as you see blood, the first sniff of blood stop. And so his bone marrow cytology was actually wall-to-wall -wall mast cell. So basically at this point, we were trying to decide, okay, um, how are we going to go about treating Cody? Uh, so in the gross disease setting, we don't have the most rewarding treatment options, unfortunately, for, for gross mast cell disease. And as you can see, our traditional chemotherapy uh, response rates um, are not super high. So we have, you know, our vimblastine prednisone protocol would typically be our first-line treatment option, uh, particularly in the microscopic disease setting, so in an in a adjuvant setting after surgery. Um, so, so this was reviewed with the owner and discussed as potential options. Then we have, obviously, you guys have heard us speak, you know, in passing, and you're probably using in your practice to some degree or have heard patients on it. Um, we had the discussion with respect to treating with the tyrosine kinase inhibitor palladia. So, 
This was reviewed with the owner, and it was actually decided, and we'll go on to it in a, in a little um, bit as well, to potentially knowing um, what degree of gross disease and high tumor burden Cody actually had, we think sometimes in our optimistic world, Palladia can be super effective. So did we really want to cause massive degranulation if we had a, an excellent response to treatment in the face of his splenic uh, disease? So we decided almost as a downstaging, this isn't anything formally um, protocoled anywhere, but almost as a downstaging technique to uh, treat him initially with vinblastine and see if we can get some response and then switch him over to Palladia orally as more of a long-term maintenance. We also did that because although we can see some pretty great responses to Palladia in the gross disease setting, we recognize that the responses probably aren't going to be that durable or long-lived, and can we do something to maybe stretch that out uh, as long as, as we can. So Palladia um, was, was uh, introduced to us in 2009, and it's a, a small molecule inhibitor uh, that blocks a variety of tyrosine kinases on cell surfaces. Uh, so it has a variety of different targets and ultimately is a competitive, competitive inhibitor of ATP and present, prevents receptor phosphorylation. So in a study initially that looked at 145 dogs with non-resectable grade 2 and 3 mast cell tumors, there is a 42% overall response rate in the gross, gross disease setting. Again, as you know, it's very hard to, to interpret response to treatment in our mast cell tumor dogs that are in the microscopic disease setting because there's nothing really to measure except for disease progression. Um, we also have recognized that uh, Palladia does have biological activity, not only in mast cell tumors, but potentially a variety of other tumor types. And whether this is by direct anti-tumor effects or inhibition of an anti-angiogenesis is a little bit unclear, and probably both are, are at play. So back to Cody. His bruising resolved, which was awesome. So that looks beautiful. So that was actually while he was receiving his vinblastine treatment, and he was clinically doing great. He had actually put on four kilos of abdominal effusion throughout his hospitalization, and that all resolved. So we couldn't have been happier about that initially. So in August 2014, so roughly um, being on Palladia, again, he came to us in March. He was on vinblastine for four weeks and then switched to Palladia. Um, he presented for essentially diarrhea, lethargy, decreased appetite. Um, and that was all thought to be attributable to the disease, or I'm sorry, to the treatment. And we know we never want the treatment to be worse than the disease, so we had tried drug holidays to see if uh, a break off treatment and then reintroducing at a lower dose might improve his tolerance of the drug. We'd also tried decreased dosage, um, all the antiemetics in the world that we could try, and essentially the owners were at the point saying that, you know, really if this is what the rest of his life is going to be, they'd rather have less time and have it be better time. Of course, who can argue with that? So we decided to reevaluate and see where we were at. So in terms of additional restaging, so we had done thoracic radiographs and abdominal ultrasound, and those were all considered to be quite normal. Um, so the splenic changes that had um, previously been noted had resolved. And then a repeat bone marrow cytology was done as well, so to see if we had any evidence of mast cell tumor um, infiltration into the marrow. This was all of the idea that Okay, it may have sounded a little bit crazy at the time, but could we actually prolong his survival and prove how he's doing? If we can prove that really the spleen is the only area that this, this um, uh, tumor is remaining. And of course, Dr. Singh sold me on the idea of he'll be, in, he'll be out of the hospital in 24 hours if we do this laparoscopically. Well, he was right. So our spleen, if you remember that previously we had had the, those hypocoaxlenic nodules are no, no, no longer evident, no perineal effusion was present. So he had uh, lapar laparoscopic assisted splenectomy. He literally went home 24 hours later. He could have gone home probably the same day, but it just seems a bit strange to do that, um, having had a major surgery. Histology of the spleen was consistent with mast cell tumor. So the spleen was still uh, positive for that. And the liver was biopsied and was a vacuolar hepatopathy. He'd obviously been on steroids, on and off steroids for quite some time at that stage. So there are some more of these pictures. Um, I'm not the best one to speak to these pictures, but the spleen is coming out the hole. <laughs> There's the spleen afterwards with those um, white nodules on it. So now we're, now what? So now we, we thought we had downstaged his disease. As far as we knew, his bone marrow was clean, his liver was clean from biopsy, the spleen was now out. But Knowing that this was a tumor that had shown itself initially to be really aggressive, his bone marrow was infiltrated, he had that, those crazy clinical signs of the bruising and peritoneal effusion, well, we weren't going to just stop treating him at that point. 
So if you recall initially, it's not that he had um, failed Vimblastine in chemotherapy, it's that we, we um, intentionally used that up front to try and downstage him and switch him to Palladia. So then the thought was, okay, now truly we are in the microscopic disease setting as far as we can tell, and can we go about a more traditional um, protocol? So he restarted Vimblastine and prednisone, and he was restaged yet again, um, September, so he had aug uh, surgery in August, mid-August, and then um, was restaged um, September 24th, and that was about the point in the protocol where we go from weekly treatment to every other week treatment, just to make sure things looked good, everything looked fine. Unfortunately, um, less than two weeks later, he presented to the emergency service um, for basically the complaint of reluctance to get up, um, panting, seeming really uncomfortable. And it's a, it's a real lesson to our interns and, and everyone and, and a reminder to ourselves all of the time to remember that just because he has cancer, he can still get anything anybody else can. So at that point, um, the neurology had looked at him for us and he really did have um, convincing cervical pain. If you remember, he had just had an abdominal ultrasound on September 24th, and we thought everything was fine, but we decided, okay, he's here. The owner is actually, as I said, they're not waiting to see people. We're contemplating MRI and all of these things to figure out what was going on with the neck. But we said, okay, you know, may seem like overkill, but let's recheck his abdominal ultrasound. So unfortunately, um, his abdominal ultrasound showed that he had progression of uh, liver nodules that were previously noted and had been biopsied at surgery, and he had evacuolar hepatopathy. And he also had um, hepatic lymphadenopathy, um, which was a new finding. Um, we did cytology of both of these areas and came back just essentially wall-to-wall -wall mast cells. So his liver, um, here we go. So you can see up here these like sort of roundish liver, hypochoic liver nodules. They're not looking like your typical kind of happy liver nodules. There again. And then those big lymph nodes that hadn't been there two weeks earlier. So once he started pain meds and we increased his dose of steroids, he was like a new dog with respect to the neck. He was perfect. Um, so, so at that point, we had assumed, you know, obviously he had failed in blasting chemotherapy because those new findings came up in the face of treatment. So we already knew what, in terms of treatment options to move forward, what were we going to do now. So he'd already had Palladia, um, and he had not tolerated it. So that was out of the question with respect to the owner's um, assessment of his quality of life. And then we know that there are a few other tyrosine kinase um, inhibitors that we have um, access to. They are both, in terms of mesitinib and imatinib, significantly more expensive um, than Palladia, and Palladia is already quite costly, so about twice the price. So just to give you an idea, maybe instead of $300 a month for the Palladia for him, we're looking six, $700 for either of these other options. Um, or we could go more traditional and go oral lamustine chemotherapy, or we could go pal palliation with prednisone alone. So, you know, I always, all these like little sayings, but we always talk to owners about the fact that just because we can do something doesn't always mean we should, but obviously it's our job to give them all the treatment options that are available. So again, very gung-ho people, they decided to go, <coughs> excuse me, with imatinib, um, mainly because of the reason that it's, uh, we have it on our shelf, and versus the mesitinib actually has to be ordered in from France, and there's an emergency drug release um, process that goes on with that. So at that point, he started imatinib, he was on, on it for about six weeks. Uh, he was doing really, really well, and with his supportive meds, his neck pain was doing quite well. And then we did a recheck abdominal ultrasound on November 5th, and that showed that um, in terms of restaging, things were fairly stable with the hepatic lymphadenopathy and the liver nodules. And we were fairly happy with that because we had seen those come out of nowhere in less than two week period of time. And so to sort of stabilize them was, you know, a, as much as we could potentially hope for at that point, and he hadn't been on it for very long. So our plan was actually to, to have seen Cody last week, but unfortunately, the weekend before, so on November 15th, um, he came in, we're still not quite sure what happened, but he had an acute onset of, of again, um, sort of reluctance to move, recumbency, I presented to our emergency service, fairly shocky and, and unstable. And at that point, his owners decided, you know, they, they had done a lot with him as you've seen, and they really didn't want to put him through more, even if it could have just been his neck pain or whatever the case may be. Um, but nevertheless, we've learned a lot from Cody. Um, we've learned that obviously he had eight months survival time post-diagnosis. 
he had an excellent response to treatment, whereas a lot of people would have potentially stopped treating him, um, given how severe his clinical signs were with his DIC at the beginning. And that, with his, in his case, side effects led us to continually reinvestigate or reevaluate our treatment plan, and a few forks in the road were encountered. Um, it is true what they say, there is a rapid recovery post lap assisted splenectomy, so you can believe that. And at this point, we still don't know the cause of his acute deterioration. A uh, post mortem examination has been done, and to this point, we really haven't found anything to explain it. There was um, no pathology noted in his um, cervical spine, and all the histology is pending at this point. Any questions? So our next speaker is uh, Steve Patton, and he's a uh, graduate of OVC and did a master's in uh, cancer research actually with Brenda Coomer as well, and so OVC grad, did an internship here and is now our uh, first year DVSC medical oncology resident. He will try and undo all the IT stuff that Danielle has oh, yeah. done. Oh, yeah. I don't know how to do that. Oh, So um, I'm going to present a fairly low-tech case compared to a lot of what you've seen so far today. But instead, what it does is highlight a, a fairly rare tumor that we've uh, had the opportunity to deal with and, in fact, are still dealing with here at OVC. Um, and rare not just for OVC, but in veterinary medicine in general. So this is Kalua. Kalua is an 11-year-old intact female uh, chocolate Labrador who uh, According to the owner, and we'll get into history in a second, has had uh, one uh, previous whelping. So she originally presented to her family vet with a history of cough, weight loss, and a very large uh, mammary-associated mass um, that, according to the owners, was first noticed about a year previous, um, initially slow-growing, and then more recently had begun to, to grow quite rapidly. Um, the only comment on the family vet's uh, referral documents was that they had appreciated on physical exam a mild increase in lung sounds in, in addition to the historical things here. So radiographs were performed. Uh, um, there was a subjective uh, increase in heart size, according to the referring veterinarian, as well as suspected pulmonary edema. So with that uh, came a, a prescription for furosemide. Some blood work was done at the time. The CBC was unremarkable. Uh, the serum biochemical profile appreciated a mild hyperglobulinemia, and at this point, I guess with the concerns over the possibility of heart disease, an aspirate of this mammary mass was offered but declined by the owner. So with this empiric treatment with furosemide, there was no real improvement in the clinical signs, but subsequent to that, uh, so Kalua did start to develop some difficulties um, rising and lying down, and subsequently was becoming more and more lethargic. And so, on representation to her family veterinarian, um, an aspirate of the mammary mass was elected for at this visit, um, which kind of brings up the first sort of message associated with this talk um, in that sort of the utility of finial aspirates or cytologic evaluation of epithelial tumors. Um, and really, there's sort of a limited diagnostic utility. We have a difficult time, cytologically at least, differentiating benign epithelial tumors from malignant ones, and so whether they're hyperplastic in nature, adenomas, carcinomas, but rather where they benefit us is as a rule-out test. Um, and so uh, basically, you know, uh, uh, mass associated with the mammary tissue, um, obviously we're all thinking, especially one as aggressive looking as this, we're all thinking carcinoma, but we want to rule out our mast cell tumors. Um, other round cell tumors or other possibilities that, that could explain the mass. So cytologically, however, uh, Kalua's was in fact consistent, um, or in fact, sorry, was in fitting with what I was just talking about, didn't in fact fit the same criteria of an epithelial tumor that we were talking about. Um, lots of criteria of malignancy, um, but actually taking more of a mesenchymal um, cytologic appearance. And so subsequently, our initial cytologic diagnosis was a pleomorphic anaplastic sarcoma. Um, and with that, the most likely differential diagnosis being histiocytic in nature. Uh, given the history of difficulty rising and lying down, she was prescribed meloxicam and tramadol and, and then sent to us here at OVC. 
So on presentation here, um, she actually was quite bright. Um, her vitals were within normal limits. Uh, physical exam didn't corroborate some of those findings of increased lung sounds. Uh, she, she was, uh, like many of our older labs, covered in lumps and bumps, um, all of which had been reported stable and present for a period of time, with the exception, of course, of this very large mammary-associated mass, mass, which unfortunately had ulcerated. Um, on presentation here at OVC, so now she was dealing with a serosanguinous discharge in our, in our waiting room, waiting to be seen by us as well. Um, though the owners with the empiric treatment of meloxicam and tramadol um, did report that she seemed a lot more comfortable and subsequently was a bit more active as well. Uh, we took upon some staging here. Her complete blood count was largely unremarkable. Uh, mild anemia and stress leukogram fitting with, you know, anemia of chronic disease uh, and, of course, you know, corticosteroid response or stress. Uh, mild changes on her serum biochemical profile. Um, that hi mild hyperglobulinemia did persist. Um, big differentials being chronic infection associated with this mass versus something like a multiple myeloma. Um, but we sort of took the approach of we can probably hold off on this and uh, uh, wait to see once we've dealt with the primary issue how that hyperglobulinemia responds. Uh, thoracic radiographs, um, three views were taken. There were a few things of note. Uh, there was, in fact, it's a little bit hard to project here, but if I can... There is a rounded soft tissue opacity between, I believe it's the, in the 11th intercostal space here. Um, it wasn't corroborated on any of the other views, so this was the only one that was there. So, um, you know, I'll get into differentials for a second, in a second. Um, alternatively, there was also this focal widening of the ninth uh, rib at the level of the costochondral junction. Um, so really, uh, from a diagnostic imaging point of view, both of these could be explained by normal benign restructuring processes, whether the summation artifacts or um, something on the outside. I'd mentioned that Kalua was fairly lumpy and bumpy. Uh, you know, if there was any remodeling of the costochondral junction. The concern, of course, given our likelihood of this being neoplastic, that these, of course, represented metastatic lesions, um, really warranting sort of soft findings, but we could repeat radiographs at a future date to, to look for progression of these signs. An abdominal ultrasound was also performed. Um, so with that, given the location of the mass, we got kind of a partial characterization of the mass. So it was mainly cavitated um, with some peripheral mineralization noted as well. There were some incidental nonspecific renal degenerative changes. Um, interestingly, there was a mild thrombosis or phlebitis um, involving the left caudal superficial at the gastric vein, which we would expect this vein to be draining at least the caudal mammary chain. So um, it's not a direct cause and effect relationship, um, but it was an interesting and relatively incidental finding too, just um, there were no clinical signs associated with it. So given just the sheer size of this mass, um, the recommendation to do something locally about it. Um, that being said, because it was such a big mass, we also weren't anticipating clean, being able to get all of the mass out surgically. And so with that, with that really the conversation with the surgery service here was about marginal resection. Um, really with the goal of palliating Kalu. Obviously, she has a very large ulcerated mass on her and subsequently trying to improve her quality of life right now. Um, and then, of course, with that, any marginal resection, we're always going to have a conversation about adjunctive radiation therapy, and I think we've talked a lot about that so far tonight. Um, so, in fact, she did go to surgery um, towards the end of August, and, and without complication, everything went quite well and was discharged from OVC just a couple days later. So, histopathologically, um, Again, everybody kind of expecting mammary carcinoma, even though our cytologic diagnosis was speaking otherwise. And so in turn, um, what we ended up finding was, again, consistent with this mesenchymal population of cells. And other sort of interesting factors is a lot of this pink matrix you can see in the background. Well, this is actually immature bone. Um, so this is osteoid that's being laid down by these mesenchymal cells. And subsequent, that being a hallmark of our ultimate diagnosis here, which was of a mammary osteosarcoma in Kahlua. So um, just about this disease in general, again, this is an uncommon disease in our veterinary patients, and it's also uncommon in humans. Um, it's defined by sort of four main criteria. Um, one, we have a uniform sarcomatous tissue, so um, we can definitely have mesenchymal components of our uh, uh, epithelial tumors, so, you know, carcinosarcomas and other tumors. Um, so these mammary sarcomas are, are homogeneously sarcomatous in nature. Um, like I was showing in those pictures of the, the histo, so they're producing 
osteoid or mature bone or bone. Um, and so subsequently, this is kind of the, the hallmark of osteosarcoma and what our pathologists are looking for. Um, in fitting with an aggressive tumor like osteosarcoma, they have a high mitotic indices. And of particular importance is that we can have primary bone osteosarcoma lesions that can metastasize cutaneously, subcutaneously. And so part of this workup would be ruling out that we don't have a primary osseous sarcoma somewhere else in the body. And so we can do this through things like um, nuclear scintigraphy or bone scans, advanced imaging, survey radiographs. But it's important to rule that out, that this is in fact isn't a metastatic lesion. I'm not going to cite them off, but um, though the veterinary literature is rather sort of compartmentalized and there's not a lot of it, um, there is reports of, of all of these various soft tissues um, have, being affected by extraskeletal osteosarcoma. Um, including, of course, mammary gland tissue, which is there at the bottom. Interestingly, there's a very common signalment amongst these patients. 11-year-olds uh, uh, fitting perfectly with Kahlua seems to be the median age reported in the few case reports we have. Um, looking at extraskeletal osteosarcomas in general, the Beagle and the Rottweiler seem to be at a higher risk. Um, if you subset them even further um, and look at specifically the mammary osteosarcomas, we see German Shepherds and Mini Poodles um, as being a higher risk of mammary osteosarcoma. Um, no real sex predilection um, reported in, in any of the case reports right now, although obviously mammary gland um, has been associated with older intact females, again, uh, fitting with Kahlua's case. Unfortunately, not unlike osteosarcoma, although it's sort of taking it another step, um, it is associated with a poor prognosis. So these tumors are highly metastatic. Um, reported as high as you know, 64 percent in a, a report in 1990. And the most common places these go, just like skeletal osteosarcomas, would be uh, other bones and lung. Um, and they also have a very high rate of local tumor recurrence, so both criteria um, fitting with an aggressive uh, tumor with a subsequent poor prognosis. Um, so like I said, there's really only a few case series in the veterinary literature. There's one, uh, interestingly, they both came out in 1998 too, so a big year for mammary, or for os extraskeletal osteosarcoma. So this was a case series of 169 dogs. Essentially, they reported a median survival time of 26 days when they looked at all of their extraskeletal osteosarcomas, with the major cause being local recurrence of the tumor. Um, when they again subset it at the mammary cases, they found a median survival time of 90 days, so improved from 26, but still unfortunately quite dismal. Um, interestingly, though, the major cause of death in this group of patients was pulmonary metastases. Um, they also looked at several different negative prognostic indicators, so um, intra-abdominal location, uh, cranial mammary gland involvement, large tumors with a short clinical history, and pulmonary metastasis were all considered to be negative prognostic indicators. Uh, the other study that came out in 1998 was a case series of 14 dogs, and essentially it really just corroborated what the other study said. So a median survival time of 74 days was reported. Um, this case, though, they saw um, adjuvant <coughs> chemotherapy as a positive uh, prognostic indicator for survival. Um, patients receiving chemo were, um, uh, without chemotherapy, I apologize, were 3.62 times more likely to, do to die from a tumor-related death. In people, again, it's just as aggressive, so high local recurrence, high metastatic rate, and a really poor five-year survival rate, which is typically what's reported in, in human oncology. Um, there's different reported causes of it, so in people, um, radiation therapy has been reported a cause of osteosarcoma. In fact, this has also been reported in uh, veterinary literature and a couple different reports back from the 80s. Very quickly breeze past this, but it's also been associated with parasitic infection. Um, and there's a few sort of sporadic case reports in the veterinary literature associated with spirocytosis um, and esophageal sarcomas. Um, when we compare extraskeletal osteosarcomas to our more comfortable and traditional skeletal osteosarcomas, um, so again, you know, surgery alone, um, I've already told you guys the, the median survival time reported is in the sort of the 33-day range. When you add chemotherapy, it does bump it up to 146 days. This in contrast to, you know, when we're going to amputation for skeletal osteosarcomas, surgery alone is, is you know, anywhere from sort of five to six months in contrast to potentially greater than a year when we add in chemotherapy to those treatments. And then just as a reminder, given Kalua's case that, you know, the, the median survival time of approximately 90 days for mammary gland osteosarcomas. 
So going back to Kahlua, um, so having gone to surgery um, and the discussion about where to go from there, obviously, um, you know, our three big treatment avenues in, in oncology, surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, um, and of course, these are not mutually exclusive of each other. We're oftentimes using them in, in, in multimodal treatment or, or combination treatments. <laughs> Given the marginal resection and incomplete margins of the tumor, there's obviously a risk of local recurrence. That being said, we know that mammary osteosarcoma, the most likely cause of death, is going to be pulmonary metastasis. And the only way we can address that would be with chemotherapy. And so sort of the, um, in the fork in the road for us in deciding between more local therapy or systemic therapy was, was that. Um, and so ultimately the recommendation was for chemotherapy at that point with the plan that, um, and, uh, Following chemotherapy, if, if we can restage Kahlua and everything still looks good, we can consider uh, more local therapy at that point, trying to prevent a tumor from coming back in the same place. So the recommendation, um, just like our skeletal patients, um, was for systemic therapy with carboplatin. So this is given uh, every three weeks for four doses based on kind of current state of the art. Uh, with the plan, again, like I was just saying, to restage um, following treatment and then have a discussion about radiation therapy. At this point, um, Kahlua has received all four of her treatments. Um, just uh, sort of uh, from a practical uh, standpoint, the owners were unable to restage at that point, although we are planning to, um, it is in plans and scheduled to, to bring Kahlua back to restage. Uh, she tolerated her chemotherapy very well. Um, and at this point, there is no evidence of the tumor recurring locally. So good news for um, Kahlua. So in summary, um, not all osteosarcoma comes from the bone, um, and so uh, to be aware of that, I guess. Extraskeletal osteosarcoma and our mammary uh, osteosarcomas, these are uncommon tumors and unfortunately are associated with a poor prognosis, so that has to come into the conversation with the owner at front initially. And again, just going back to that idea about epithelial tumors um, in uh, our canine patients, and uh, we get a lot of questions, particularly from the students, um, about uh, cytology, and so we'd like to think of it more as a, a rule out um, uh, tool rather than to rule in something else. And so again, it, it, it served us well with Kahlua here in terms of uh, her particular diagnosis. So this is Kahlua, and you guys have any questions? So Val is a, from the Gaspé Z, she is a radiation oncologist. And she graduated from okay. from Sydney Sang, and then did a medical oncology residency at Wisconsin, and then a radiation oncology residency in Zurich, Switzerland. She was running uh, the only radiation therapy unit for treatment of pets in Australia before we grabbed her back. So basically, we've had the new machine for about well, 14, 15 months now. So I was just gonna show you some pre and post radiation images. Not that it's, so it's very low tech. So <clears throat> this is actually the first brain tumor that we've treated. Okay, so here's a T T1 uh, post contrast gadidium for the MRI. So you can see here the tumor. And this is um, actually the dog 14 months down the road. So he's presented originally for seizures. He hasn't had any seizures since. And basically, you can see that post-radiation, there's basically no contrast. The tumor is pretty much gone, but nothing has replaced the tissue. So the, like, it's not like you have new neurons growing. Um, but basically, as far as we can tell, this is a complete response. Normally, for a brain tumor, if he follows the book, he should go two to three years um, survival. So he's <coughs> well on his way for doing that. Second one is actually the first rabbit I've ever treated with uh, radiation, and it's actually a rabbit from uh, the States. So it's a, it's a special rabbit from Michigan. Um, and this rabbit has a thymoma. There's a report out there of 19 rabbits treated with palliative radiation for thymoma, and the median survival time, if they survive the radiation period, is actually about three years. So once again, they do quite well. And this is um, Pierrot pre-radiation, so that's his heart here, 
and that's his big thymoma that's pretty much pushing everything up front. And this is at the third radiation. So what happens with the thymoma is that they're full of lymphocytes. So if you give them radiation, the lymphocyte dies and then everything kind of shrinks down. So at the time of his last radiation, he only had like a little mediastinal mass in front of the heart, but the heart itself had gone back to his normal position. And this is the diagnostic CT, and this is the CT scan that's actually in the Linux. So this is what the CBCT, when we do position them, that's what they look like. And we've done a dog, um, thymoma, with the same idea. So this was a very large thymoma, and that's after two doses of radiation. So as far as the CBCT and the Linac goes, we, cannot, we can only do so much because we cannot do like the entire dog. So this is the dog pre-radiation with the large tumor that was going like uh, probably four ribs down and post radiation that was at the third radiation it had once again shrink down quite significantly nasal lymphoma um, this is actually Zeus um, he was a 14 year old cat that presented with the biggest gunk coming out of his nose and he was completely obstructed so that's his nasopharynx here you can see that's his brain the back of his eyes and the nasopharynx was just completely obstructed that's in the moulage so that's his pre-CT, uh, pre-radiation CT, and that's at the last dose of radiation, so he had a complete response. So the tumor just melted away. Uh, he got 10 fractions, so probably by the third or the fourth fraction, all of a sudden he started breathing well. So it was, um, had a very nice response. And that's him uh, six weeks down the road. So the only thing you have is really in cats is alopecia. And they usually just look a little bit drier, but they don't get the side effects like the dogs do. He is. Yes, he is, <laughs> of he course. Is he is doing fine. Uh, this is Baggio. So Baggio was a two-year-old um, German Shepherd, he is still, he is still, he's still alive and he was here today. So um, he had originally an oral squamous cell carcinoma and when we did the first CT, is we're like, oh, we're gonna send him to surgery, it's a little, it was just little in the maxilla. But when we did the CT, it had a, actually a very large intranasal component that made it not possible um, to do surgery on him. And the radiation, that's actually him um, five fraction into 17 fractions. So he had a complete response. The problem we were left with is actually the, the teeth were removed to biopsy. So there was no, so the tumor went away. Then the teeth was not there. There was, so he basically developed a neuronasal fistula. And that's the reason why he was here today is to basically close that oral nasal fistula. Um, and he's still doing well and hopefully that will hold. Nasal tumor, another one of those. Um, usually we say nasal tumor, if you do nothing, median survival time, two months. If you do curative radiation, 14 to 19 months. If you do palliative radiation, six to eight months. Uh, this is a dog actually with palliative radiation and um, she's still undergoing treatment, so she's not done yet. And she had a very nice response, but I'm not gonna show you the one that don't respond so well. But the majority of them do respond, but not that beautifully usually. Oral melanoma, um, a little bit like uh, River. So this was a dog that had a very fast growing oral melanoma and it pretty much had also a complete response. Enough that we ha actually ended up having trouble positioning the dog because it was not fitting in his moulage because the moulage was fitting to his tumor and then when that went away, you can see that he's not as stable but we could manage uh, to put him in position. And then a couple of cases, we had two injection site sarcoma. Fortunately for us, we see way less than we used to. Uh, but the two cases were cats where the vaccine sarcoma was rapidly growing. The first one was on his neck and the CT doesn't give it justice, but basically what happens, it was growing very fast. We gave it uh, curative radiation. The tumor shrank down by half the size, took him to surgery, got clean margins, and the tumor was pretty much encapsulated in necrotic. So it looks like we're gonna be good. And this was the second one, it's Eric the fat cat. So you can see this is all fat, which was actually good for him because I could spare easily his bladder and everything else because he was quite away from his tumor. This is his um, back leg. And this is actually a mixosarcoma. So that's probably the reason why he looks so kind of foamy. This is pre-radiation. 
and that's towards the end of radiation. And right now, we're just letting it shrink down. And probably in about a month, uh, we're going to take him to surgery, and hopefully we're going to be able to not amputate him because he's a 10-kilo cat, and we don't think that he can do very well on tray legs. So hopefully, it will shrink down nicely. And then my last one is... Um, it's not that easy to see, but it is a rectal uh, mast cell tumor on a husky. And this is actually pre-radiation. So when you did rectal that dog, he had hemo hemochasia and he had tons of kind of blood um, and straining. And this is obviously an intact male. So he has actually testicular tumors also, which we're ignoring. He has a large uh, prostate and his bladder is somewhere here. And in his rectum, he had that five centimeter firm mass here. And that's uh, another view where you can see the tumor here. And after one or two doses of radiation, uh, this is actually, sorry, that's his last dose of radiation. So we still have the prostate here, the bladder here, but everything is kind of moved back and you only have a little bit. So the tumor went from five centimeters to about a centimeter and uh, the dog is way more comfortable. So he's actually continuing to be in downstage and he's probably gonna be switched over to Palladia. And that's about it. So, and uh, infomercial that Val and I will be doing a medical radiation oncology talk in Toronto at the OVMA in January. Our next speaker, our final speaker, will be going back to surgery again, mm -hmm. Michelle Oblak, who's a graduate of here and then did a DVSC in surgery and is board certified in surgery. Mm -hmm. She did a surgical oncology fellowship at the University of Florida and is back as our surgical oncologist. Um, this is going to be really brief because I just spoke with probably some of you guys not that long ago, but um, I just wanted to really quickly touch on a couple of topics. Uh, the first one's just going to be a case and then I wanted to talk very, very briefly on kind of head and neck tumors as well. Um, I'm, this is going to be sort of the flip side of what Dr. Singh just talked about. So I'm really, really excited that we have really great options for some of our patients now that have small tumors, um, that we can go in and do these minimally invasive procedures. I think that's really excellent. The good news with those tumors is usually those cases are getting surgery anyways. Um, I think the challenging cases are the ones that are coming in on the other side. So they have huge tumors or they have tumors with, with vascular thrombi or things. And a lot of times those cases, people are told that there's nothing that can be done. And so I just want to remind you that if you have a motivated owner, it's probably a good idea to even just send us some images or call me. Please feel free or email me before you say there's nothing that can be done if you have a motivated owner. Um, surgical oncology, there's such a spectrum and most of it you're actually dealing with in practice. But overall, it's not for everybody. So some of these cases are going to seem um, more extreme than you're comfortable with, more extreme than a client is comfortable with. My job is absolutely not to ever try and tell anybody that they should be doing any of those things, but just to tell you that there are some options. Um, I think the important thing to remember with all these cases, though, is it's really about case selection. So we're not talking about doing big aggressive surgeries in animals that have metastatic disease, in animals that have com comorbidities or things like that. But it's amazing how many tumors can actually be surprisingly either long-term control or curable um, and we don't necessarily always consider those as even surgical candidates so just keep that in mind um, and I wanted to start with Shiloh so she was a six-year-old spayed female mixed breed dog shepherd mix um, and she came to us with a two-month history of chylothorax initially it was intermittent she was going in to be tapped by her vet occasionally uh, it wasn't really bothering her it wasn't really bothering the owners and so they kind of just waited on it for a little while and then about a week before she presented, she was presenting for more frequent episodes of chylothorax. So she'd filled up and had several liters of chylothorax removed. And so she presented to us sort of to have a little bit more workup and, and evaluation. Um, the only other really thing that was noticed with her is that she had some weight loss. So when she came in with us, had the usual diagnostics and staging. I'm not going to go through that. We've been through those several times tonight. But essentially, um, what it came down to was on evaluation, there was some question about whether or not she had something um, in her cranial metastinum, and so she ended up in CT. Now, it looks like the video is not going to play, but that's okay. Um, we'll skip that for now just because it's getting late, but essentially what I want you to notice on her is that within her, so this is our CT scan. This is a standard window, so a soft tissue window. Um, you can see her heart here, and then there's contrast within her caudal vena or cranial vena cava and caudal vena cava. But as you can see in this cranial vena cava, there's a pretty significant filling defect. Um, there's actually some tracking of 
filling defect heading towards um, one of her brachial veins as well. And then you can see this round structure, uh, just cranial to her heart. So all of those things are abnormal and unexpected. Based on this information, what we were suspecting is that she had an invasive um, thymoma. And so we can see thymomas fairly frequently. Quite often, they just present as a single nice discrete nodule. And we're really excited when we see those. And we can actually sometimes do those minimally invasively. Um, but in these cases, when we're talking about either bigger masses or invasive masses, we really need to think about doing more of an open procedure because we need to have our hands in there. The risk of hemorrhage is significantly higher. Um, and we're talking about more delicate dissection. And so one of the challenges is we were talking essentially, in this case, I explained to the owners that really the, the surgery would involve occluding her cranial vena cava for an unknown but hopefully short period of time in order to remove this thrombus if it would come out. Um, essentially, we were getting to the point of what we'd start to discuss in terms of, you know, is this getting into heroics? This is a major procedure. We're cutting into major vessels. There's a potential for a significant hemorrhage. Um, but this dog couldn't live the way she was. So they were faced with a situation where it was like, OK, well, we euthanize her now because she's getting this constant effusion, or we try something and see what happens, with the understanding that I might get in there and say, look, there's nothing I can do. You know, this is adhered everywhere. There's multiple areas that I can't address. And so you know, we went in with the expectation that we we're going to try and see what happened. Um, so she had a median sternotomy. Um, the, uh, the mass you could actually see, and surprisingly, is fairly small. So the next image will have a, a good scale for it. But this is the mass here. And then extending to the tail is actually just the normal thymic tissue that's left behind. So she actually had a full thymus, which is kind of interesting for a six-year-old dog. Um, but the mass was actually fairly easy to dissect in itself. Wasn't that big, wasn't really adhered to anything. Um, and so this is a bit more unusual. Usually those giant thymic masses that are invasive are big. And they're kind of filling the thoracic cavity. But in this one, it was essentially just for whatever reason throwing thrombi into all the major vessels. I was able to occlude her uh, brachycephalic trunk, um, essentially, and then just able to get to just behind the heart um, and get to the, the cava that way. Um, dissected everything out. The thrombus was a little bit adhered to the cava wall, so it was a little bit challenging. But amazingly in her, um, so you can see in this image, this is her head. So this is her heart here, where the yellow arrow is. You can see her cranial lung fields here. This is a sternotomy, so she's in dorsal recumbency. Um, the arrow here is pointing to that left cable thrombus. So on the, on the right um, vessel, you can see some blue in there, so you can see actual blood flow. On this side, you can see it's just quite dilated in comparison. Um, and then this was her thymic tumor in here. And so amazingly, in this case, everything sort of just peeled its way out. Um, it was so chronic in history and in nature that it wasn't, there wasn't any blood flow really going in that area. And so amazingly, just being able to occlude things temporarily, close up the cava, um, that part of things really minimal, minimal bleeding associated with it. And you can see on this image on the right, so here's her mass here. That's the rest of her normal thymus that's left behind. And then this is all the mass of, of tissue that was within her vena cava. And so we know... In, there's been some reports actually from here that we know in animals that have cranial vena cable obstruction, they can have secondary chylothorax as a result of that. Um, in her case, we actually then went ahead and, and put in this pleuroport. And so these are really handy devices and something for you to keep in mind if you're dealing with any animals that have chronic um, pleural effusions, uh, because essentially it allows us to percutaneously drain um, of thoracic fluid. And so in her case, I was able to get what I felt based on my own visualization, was probably about 90 to 95% of the thrombus. But there was a little bit left behind. So I couldn't get it all. It was getting to a point where I was sort of like, OK, time is, time is running out. I don't want to leave her occluded for too long. Um, and so based on that, um, at that point, I said, OK, that's enough. We, we, we need to finish where we are. And so I did put this in just in case she continued to have some effusion. Um, fortunately, her chylothorax resolved, which is great news for her. But um, these ports are really nice and just something to keep in mind. They come with these special needles called Huber needles which essentially are just non-coring needles. So they can be used over and over again. And the vast majority of them don't seem to clog in the, in the thorax, just because you don't get as much um, in terms of you don't have an omentum or things um, to be occluding them. And it's all percutaneous. So it's all under the skin. So you don't have to worry about having them have an external drain. And so I've managed animals with either chylothorax that's had surgery and didn't resolve, or malignant effusions for six, to, six months to a year with these. So just something to keep in mind. Um, in her case, amazingly, she went home two days later, and she really hasn't looked back. 
Um, she did develop a little bit of a blood clot within her cranial cava um, into her jugular vein, which isn't super surprising given the fact that I had to handle the wall of the vessel a lot more than I'd like to, but that was completely non-clinical, um, and she's continuing to do well about six months post-op. So I think this is just a really great example of the fact that not every animal is going to be amenable to this. This could have had really negative consequences, but I think we always need to consider these cases, and certainly when you have motivated owners who are willing to try, knowing what the consequences and the risks are, it's worth considering. Um, and then the other thing I just wanted to really, really briefly talk about was just uh, mandibulectomies and maxillectomies. Um, essentially, overall, I wanted to just remind everyone, if you haven't dealt with one of these cases, especially mandibulectomies, these dogs do extremely well. They're amazingly non-painful, even post-op. These dogs, often I'm feeling like I should be sending them home to the day of surgery because they just feel great. Um, they eat well, they, they behave well. Um, these are really quite amazing surgeries. Um, and the reason I think it's something that's really important to consider as well is that a lot of these head tumors can have very, very good long-term control from a disease perspective. So even some of your melanomas, your osteosarcomas, um, even some of the more aggressive tumors, for some reason that in the head and neck region, it's more of a local disease problem in a lot of these cases. And these dogs really do remarkably well. So cosmetically, they can be a little bit more challenging to deal with. I think a lot of people feel that the maybe are a little bit more aggressive because of the cosmetic effects. You may be removing bone or you are removing bone in these cases. But I think it's a good idea. Just keep them in mind. Um, you know, we have an incredible number of dogs they had a tumor just removed superficially a year or two ago, and then now it's come back, and now it's big, and it's been continuing to grow inward because it was removed on the surface. And at that point, it can be a lot more difficult to treat those dogs. And so especially a lot of your epiluses and things that are really just showing up as very small tumors to begin with, those can almost be outpatient procedures. I always keep them in for a day, but honestly, they're, they're really quite amazing how well these dogs recover. And so if I can see those dogs at the beginning, it's much easier to do the treatment. It's a much less expensive, and a lot of these cases, especially some of the acanthomyous cases, are cured. Um, so just keep that in mind. So these dogs, all of these dogs, have had mandibulectomies. This dog had just basically her canine, um, her premolar one, and right to midline removed, and you can't even tell. Um, I generally don't shave anything on the mandibulectomies if I'm not taking anything from the skin. So if there's only an oral tumor, you don't really need to remove any skin. And so these dogs often go home looking pretty normal, uh, and the owners are often amazed. This dog actually had its entire hemiramus removed. And so this dog's tongue does stick out, but beyond that, the dog eats completely normally, as happy as can be. Same with this dog here. Um, and in both of these cases, these dogs had horrific tumors, so awful, disgusting tumors. And so they are much happier and much more comfortable without that tumor there. Um, this dog actually had bilateral, um, it was an epulis that was surrounding its entire, all of its, canine, its canines and all of its incisors at the front. Um, and amazingly, because it's a boxer, it had such an underbite, it actually looks like a normal dog now. <laughs> so you can't even tell. He actually looks, to me, he looks better because he had this <laughs> awful underbite. Um, but he actually had both, both canines and his entire, um, his entire rostral uh, mandible removed. So same example here. So this is Cleo. Um, she also had this awful, nasty osteosarcoma. Um, and so she had a bilateral rostral mandibulectomy as well. And this is her immediately post-op. So you can see on, in her case, she has a little bit of swelling there, but nothing much beyond that. And this is actually what it looks like when you look at her. This is immediately in surgery, so obviously not as pretty of a picture. But you can't see that significantly in these guys. Straight, straight on, you can't really tell, especially the dogs that have really droopy lips. Um, and I have to say, I've yet to find an owner that was unhappy with their decision to do, especially mandibular surgery. So these dogs do so well. Um, you know, there's the very, very occasional dog that's such a finicky eater, it's difficult to deal with to begin with. But the majority of these dogs do fantastic. Um, same thing with maxillectomy. The big thing with maxillectomies is they are going to be a little bit more cosmetically effective. So you're going to notice they have a little bit more sinking of the face or things like that. Um, this dog here... This dog here had um, a squamous cell carcinoma just over the canine, so just a bit of a rostral maxillectomy. So you can see the nose just looks a little bit abnormal. Um, this dog here actually had um, an osteosarcoma of the, the caudal aspect of the maxilla, so she actually lost her um, ventral orbit as well. And so initially these guys have a little bit more puffing of air, and then that does scar down. But 
Again, dog did great for three years post-op. Um, essentially just had that little bit of change in appearance, but no, no negative effects. Um, and then these dogs both had maxillectomies as well. Um, Rex actually had maxillectomy and then followed that with radiation therapy, and he just had his one-year checkup. Um, and he's cancer-free after a year. So not saying these cases are for everybody, not saying these surgeries are for everybody, um, but I just think it's important to kind of keep these in mind. Um, I'm always amazed how many owners, when I, talk, when I talk to them about these procedures and show them pictures, and I always show them pictures, and I tell them, your dog's going to look weird even just because it's shaved even before I do surgery. And a lot of times, the vast majority of owners, when the dogs go home, go, oh, that's not actually as bad as I was expecting. Um, and a lot of these dogs do incredibly well and have fairly minimal side effects. Um, and, you know, two days post-op are eating completely normally, behaving normally, and on minimal meds. Um, and so generally, I think it's just something to, to be aware of. There are s slightly more risks in terms of oral nasal fistulas and things like that with maxillectomies. But again, generally, those are going to be the really big procedures, the bigger tumors and things. Um, and certainly, these dogs feel a lot better than they do when they have those big tumors present. So, sorry, I talked quick because I know everybody's probably exhausted. Um, it's been a very long marathon. But if anybody has any questions, um, and please feel free to email myself or any of the, the surgeons on um, soft tissue at any point. If you guys ever have cases, if you have questions, I'm always happy to look at pictures or chat on the phone um, because I know some of these cases can be really challenging and decision making can be really tough. So, Thanks, thanks Michelle. I'd like to thank all my speakers and thank you guys for coming and if anybody wants a tour we can do that afterwards but we'll let you go and grab the gang here with any cases or any questions you have. So thanks for coming. <laughs>